us by Aunt Dolly about 25 or 30 years ago. It's a, it was written by Teresa Wilhelm. She was Lewis and Katie Wilhelm's daughter, their eldest daughter. She was born in 1893 and she died in 1979. She wrote this book in the 50s. So this is the story that um, Lewis told her and her brothers and sisters and her mom about his childhood in Germany before he came to America. I hope you really enjoy it. I'm starting the story after he returns from one of his business trips or trips for the farm in, uh, well, I don't know what year this would have been, but um, we're, we're starting with a story he's telling them when he returns from his trip. When Papa returned from one of these trips, whether by train or by buckboard and team, he was especially merry and gay. He was a great storyteller, and when he could give the time to tell it, we all, including Mama, sat around listening enthralled. He told us all the events of each trip, in detail from beginning to end. He took these trips off and on over a period of years. Our supper was early in those days, around 5 o'clock, as some of the babies had to be in bed so early. And after the things were neatly cleared away, we still had time to gather in the dining room and listen eagerly to Papa's stories about the trip about the many night camps, about Mockingbird Canyon, Temescal Canyon, Box Springs Grade, Val Verde, Surprise Springs, Old Woman's Well, <laughs> Thousand Palms, Diamond Valley, Hemet, where the ground is as level as the floor. Magic words, places that we had never seen, but they were painted before our wondering eyes in vivid word pictures. And some of these we all own, and someday when you are bigger, you will go with me to see them, he would say enthusiastically. And then his eyes would take on a faraway look, and he would tell about his boyhood days in Germany. We lived in Sasha Weimer, in a little village called Schielid on the River Geis, he would begin. Our family had lived there for over 300 years in a large brick house. We were millers. Our house was very near the river, and a large mill wheel went around and around in the river and turned off the wheel, which ground the grain, which the farmers from all over the countryside around brought to be ground. I was called the stout little miller boy, and I helped to watch and take care of the mill, before and after school. And what I liked, too, was to go around the many farmers to do the collecting. I loved to watch the women bake bread in the big out-of-doors bake ovens. The loaves were very large and made of the dark flour. My mother baked enough to last for quite a while. One time I had to take a couple of loaves to a neighbor. It was winter time. I had to go over a small sloping hill. I slid down this hill sitting on one of those loaves while I carried the other one. My mother heard of this and she punished me. <laughs> the countryside was very fresh and beautiful in the spring. Very white ducks with their bright yellow legs would walk all over the meadows and hop in and out of the clear little river. The nearby dark forests were filled with ferns, blue forget-me-nots, violets, and snowy lily of the valley. Rye and other grain were sown in the various fields, as well as flax. How beautiful the blue flax fields were. Soft breezes blew through them until they bent and waved like lakes of water. And when the flax was cut, it went through a long process. It was soaked in water, and it was spun by the women during the long winter evenings. And the cloth was laid on the grass and sprinkled over and over again until it bleached very white. The shirts and towels and other clothing made of this linen lasted for many years. The people lived not too far apart in sort of a little village, Papa went on. The central building was the village church. We were all Catholics in Shelid and our social life revolved around the church holy days. There were many of these holidays during the year. May Day was an especially happy one. There was village dancing around the maypole by the children on the village green. There was feasting and more dancing early in the evening by the grown-ups. In the church, there was the crowning of Mary as Queen of May. And on the village green, sometime during the day, one of the sweetest of the girls was crowned queen for the day. I loved to dance, and I not only had fun dancing around the maypoles, but I stayed up as long as I could in the evenings to dance with the older folks. Some of the ladies were very stout, and it was all I could do to hold around their waists for the quick German waltzes. <laughs> and I started in dancing as a very small boy. All the children learned the country dances very young. 
Another happy event was the Corpus Christi procession around the village from the church and back again. The priests, the altar boys, young girls in white veils, and then all of the congregation marched. There were many of these happy feast days. The fields and farms were out away from the village homes. So the men and the women and the girls too in harvest time went out to the fields to work every day. Some of the fields were quite a distance away. Often you would see some elderly woman or young girl if there was no school gathering all the geese of the village to herd them out to some distant lush meadow for the day. She was the goose girl, a pretty sight on some green valley or knoll. The public roads were lined with plum trees, and each family took several of these trees as their own each year in order to pick and dry this fruit for winter food. There were several grand days of picking fruit during the year, and also several picnic days for going out into the forest to gather the wild nuts. Usually almost the whole village took part in these affairs, a merry sociable time. And there was a great deal of singing as we walked back and forth on these excursions. But there was much work to be done always, in the fields and around the barns and in the vegetable gardens. The storing of vegetables for winter use because the snows were heavy. Washing was done once every three to four months on a grand scale. We had large presses stored with dozens of sheets, shirts, and other homespun clothes. We made our own soap. Water was boiled out in the yard and the clothes were rinsed in the clear flowing river then spread out on the meadow to bleach and dry. The making of sausages, rendering out lard, and the curing of bacon and of sauerkraut. We were early risers, so between the hearty early breakfast and the big noon meal, a generous lunch was sent out to the workers in the fields about nine o'clock. One of my favorite Sunday noon dinners was well-cooked sauerkraut and pork. A pork shoulder is especially good. Over the sauerkraut, when served on our plates, we spread split peas, which had been well-cooked with a few potatoes, and then mashed. Over this, we sprinkled chopped green onion tops and a dash of black pepper. One person always stayed home from church and looked after the place and watched the immense pot of sauerkraut and pork so that it would not boil dry. We took turns at this chore. Delicious coffee cakes, cinnamon buns, apple cakes, prune or plum cakes were served on Sundays and holidays. My father, Adam Wilhelm, was killed during the War of 1870. Bismarck was in power then. I was born in 1863, so I was a little boy of seven when my father was killed. There was much work always, and my mother married again, a Mr. Keel. The time came when I had a little sister, Teresa Keel, afterwards Mrs. Kind and then Mrs. Schroeder. <laughs> we had many happy times together. As little children, we were kept very busy with our prayers, catechism, and school studies. Immediately after breakfast, the whole household knelt down and said the morning prayers. It was the same right after the evening meal. The church bell rang three times a day for the Angelus. That was at 6 o'clock a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m., Everyone, whether in field or home, stopped all work to say the Angelus Prayer. We went to school early after doing our home chores. School was strict and thorough, and we went half a day on Saturdays as well as all during the week. School was always a delight to me. I had a wonderful memory, and I understood and learned everything early. On the contrary, my little sister found school a drudgery and found her happiness in sewing, knitting, and garden work. <laughs> like me. <laughs> but she was made to go to school, and she studied though often with tears running down her cheeks. I determined to study to be a schoolmaster, so I studied diligently, Latin, mathematics, history, and I read all the good books I could get my hands on. In a few years, our good mother died, and a short time later, our stepfather married again. Our stepmother had been a school teacher and was very strict with us, though a very good woman in her way. I could see and understand that I would never inherit the farm and mill. It would in time go to relatives of the Keels, my step-parents. I determined with all my heart to be a school teacher, and the thought came to me as I progressed in my studies that I might dare to go to America. By the time I was 18, I was resolved to go. I talked it over with the priest of the parish and with my schoolmaster. They considered me a lad of promise. I had done well in school and was ambitious to get ahead. They talked it over with the mayor of the nearest town. There was three years of military training staring me in the face. All boys had to take this training, but I wanted no part of it. The mayor and officials knew of me for years and liked me. 
I talked my plans over with them and convinced them that I had no future in the Shilid by the Geis. I really don't know how to pronounce that. I may be getting it completely wrong. <laughs> I guess I could Google it. But I can't even find a town with that name, so that's really not going to help. <laughs> Back to the story. <laughs> Finally, a passport was secured for me. Harold o. Wilhelm has his passport in his mementos of our father. Now Harold goes by Uncle Pat. I don't know why, but um, he's just always been known as Uncle Pat. I have no idea when they started calling him Uncle Pat, actually. I don't know, but Harold is Uncle Pat, future genealogists. <laughs> I had then talked it over with my step-parents. They gave me money for passage on the ship, as well as some extra for my use when I arrived in America. I also had a large trunk full of clothes, especially homespun linen shirts. I had always been a good-natured son to them and had worked hard on the place. My little sister looked at me and cried. So I said to her, Someday when you are a little older, I will send money over from America for your passage on a boat. She was about 10 years old when I left for America. Upon arriving in New York, I obtained work there. I worked very hard. And in my one room, I learned that being homesick could be a real sickness. So that's the start of our series, Lewis's Childhood in, Germ Lewis's childhood in Germany. Um, I've got a, <laughs> a lot more stories to do. That was only three pages. So I got a lot more to do. Hopefully I can be on kind of a regular schedule. Um, you know, life happens, and in my life, lots of things happen. So, yeah. Um, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to um, keep up with the story. All right. See you next time.